Welcome to Verse by Verse, the radio ministry of Calvary Chapel McDonough. Like the Apostle Paul, our desire is to declare to you the whole counsel of God. So at Calvary Chapel McDonough, we journey book by book, chapter by chapter, and verse by verse through the Bible. By presenting all of God's Word, our hope and prayer is that you would get to know God better, hopefully better equipping you to make up your own mind about Him. Now let's join Pastor Daniel as he teaches through the Bible, verse by verse. We're going to continue forward now in Hebrews chapter 2. The last time we were able to cover two verses, uh, and it was verse 1 and verse 2. Therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. For if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, and we got to a place where we were talking about the danger of drifting away if we didn't give our full attention to Jesus, and we talked about that just reward of disobedience being a negative consequence, and we even talked about how the nation of Israel in the wilderness faced some of those negative consequences. And we want to continue on now to verse 3. Before we get to the better part, we've got to get through with this warning part. So we'll pick back up in verse 3. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and was confirmed to us by those who heard him? We start out, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? So the obvious thing there is, do not neglect so great a salvation. And that is the just reward or the positive benefit is this great salvation that we have been given through Jesus Christ. And one of the big questions that comes up in this warning in the book of Hebrews is the question, is the author of Hebrews threatening these Hebrew believers in Christ with the loss of their salvation if they neglect the salvation of Jesus and return to Judaism? And I don't believe that this verse alone stands as proof that one can lose their salvation, but it is proof that those who neglect so great a salvation will either as believers suffer loss or discover that they never surrendered to Jesus as Lord, and thus were never converted. In our modern theology, we've made room for the carnal Christian. But there is no such room in the theology of this author. The person who would live a carnal, self-pleasing life will either fall under the burden of their own guilt, and either humble themselves before God, or be destroyed by their own sins. This theology will develop more as the book of Hebrews progresses. But it is sufficient to say that a person cannot live for both the world and Jesus at the same time, for no person can serve two masters. Therefore there is no escape from the justice of God such as the hypocrite believes will be extended to him or her. And it is a time for believers to reflect on the holiness of the one whom we serve. And I'll take just another minute to answer the question, can I lose my salvation? Or just, I really don't know that I can answer that question because I believe it's a bad question. A person can't lose their salvation uh, like you lose a dollar bill out of your pocket. Jesus is far greater, and his grace and his mercy and his love for you is far greater than for you to ever accidentally lose your salvation. Uh, there is a danger, and that's what we were just talking about, of neglecting salvation <clears throat> to uh, the consequence of a person who has truly accepted Jesus Christ and is converted that person will come to a place where they will not have fellowship with the Lord, and they may live and find themselves living in a way where they don't know or understand or have any confidence in their salvation. And can I tell you, for a believer, one that is supposed to be reborn in a new creation in Christ, living that way is a miserable, miserable way to live. 
the other or the other case there is not the believer and I, some people have used that whole thing of not knowing whether or not they're saved and to me that is just as bad as those who seem to all the time want to teach you about you're in danger of losing your salvation well if you don't have any security as to whether or not you belong to Christ what's the difference can I tell you you know and we talked about it last time if you are willingly trusting and obeying and I'm not saying perfectly but if your desire is to trust and obey Jesus because the person who is dead in spirit does not want to or even care to obey the teachings of the Lord so how does one know whether or not we're neglecting so great a salvation we discussed this last time when we talked about drifting away from the faith this time we talk again about neglecting so great a salvation and just a quick review we go through to see if we're neglecting so great a salvation the warning for the Hebrews was that they would turn back and return to the old covenant or their old way of life so we can apply that to us today uh, this great salvation is neglected when one turns away from believing the gospel of Jesus Christ and turns toward the formal way of life now a term has been used in the church and called backsliding <clears throat> that's what's being talked about here is you kind of slide back into the old way of doing things can I assure you that if you are Christ that when you slide back you're not going to be happy you're not going to be content you're not going to find the the pleasure like you used to find because you've been changed on the inside so it does you great harm instead of <clears throat> causing you to find that pleasure and that peace that you once had uh, this salvation is also neglected when one turns away from studying the Word of God. And it's by that continual washing and studying of the Word of God that we are able to stand firm in our faith and not neglect so great and not neglect so great a salvation. This salvation is also neglected when one turns away from participating in the church and or no longer desires to be identified with the assembly of believers it's in our fellowship together and we're all human there are times when even uh, the assembly of believers uh, we will do things to hurt one another hopefully not intentionally and I'm not talking about for that reason <clears throat> but you, you kinda got a good idea of whether you are nurturing the salvation at work in your life or if you're neglecting it by your desire to be in fellowship with a godly loving group of people so why should we not neglect <clears throat> this great salvation moving on in verse 3 this salvation which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord this new covenant which is so great a salvation was first announced by the Lord Jesus Christ himself in due time God became human in order to save humanity from its sin <clears throat> this is so great a salvation because God's overwhelming love for his human creation is demonstrated through the life and message of grace and truth found only in Jesus Jesus is the voice of God proclaiming salvation, forgiveness, and redemption to all the world. Jesus is the voice of hope to those who are in bondage to sin, to all who are condemned for each one's failure to meet the high standard of God's holiness, and to all who can through no means of their own pay the price to redeem themselves from eternal separation from the light, life, and love that is God. 
Jesus is the voice of God welcoming all to take part in this new and better covenant of God's grace and mercy that is so great a salvation. To neglect this salvation is to neglect Jesus and to refuse to hear the call of Jesus, who is the great shepherd is calling his sheep into the safety of his protection and love. This great salvation <clears throat> was confirmed to us by those who heard him. This salvation has been confirmed by those who are eyewitnesses to the life and teachings of of Jesus Christ. It's true that we cannot empirically prove salvation, meaning we can't put it in a test tube. And sh we should not be required to, because this truth is not proven by science, but by the testimony of the eyewitnesses of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. These eyewitnesses of Jesus were bold enough to stand in the face of cruel opposition and still proclaim Jesus as the King of Kings. Most of these eyewitnesses became martyrs as they were killed for their testimony. They were killed not because they were liars or lunatics or violent, but because their testimony of Jesus was true and provides the hope necessary to overthrow the bondage of sin and death. This world system uses the bondage of sin <clears throat> as a way to manipulate the masses to serve political tyrants. This world system uses the fear of physical suffering and death to punish and control those who would throw off the shackles of political and religious slavery in favor of the freedom and liberty found in the kingdom of God. In the next verse, the author of Hebrews says, tells us that God, who is truth itself, agrees with these eyewitness accounts. Therefore, the testimony of these eyewitnesses of Jesus that we have received in the New Testament is a reliable and trustworthy word on which we can fully place our trust for so great a salvation found in this new covenant of God's grace. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 2, verse 4. <clears throat> God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders, with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit, according to His will. So what we find here is not only are there eyewitness accounts who have passed the New Testament to us, but God is bearing witness to Jesus as the supreme revelation of, that we have to give a earnest heed to, that we've got to pay our attention to, that we can't neglect. God is himself a witness to this great salvation in the person of Jesus Christ. And in the person of Jesus Christ, God demonstrated powerfully his intention to establish a new covenant of grace versus the old covenant of law. One of the ways that we can see these signs and wonders that God used to bear witness about Jesus Christ <clears throat> is by looking at Old Testament prophecy. And we find in Old Testament prophecy and in the fulfilled prophecies in the life of Jesus, no, there's almost no greater evidence, there's no way that so much of that prophecy could have been manufactured Sure, you might could pick a, 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 a prophecy or two like Jesus choosing uh, a foal of a donkey to ride into Jerusalem. Yes, he chose that, even though that and, and that fulfilled prophecy. But there are so many other prophecies that he could not have had control over if he were not God. Since the prophecies are fulfilled, we can know then that God is bearing witness with signs and wonders to this great salvation. One example of these signs and wonders is the virgin birth of Jesus. This fulfills the prophecy of a Redeemer that was given to Adam and Eve when they first fell from God's grace and their disobedience to God's commands. 
God then moved through the history of Israel to preserve this promised bloodline of Abraham. We know that it was by faith that it was accounted as righteousness to Abraham. And Abraham was promised to be a father, even though he got to be a rather old man before a son was ever born. And Abraham attempted many different ways, and finally the child of promise was given to him and Sarah. That child of promise was Isaac, and it was through faith in God that Abraham was willing to offer up his son Isaac, even though he didn't know how God was going to keep his promise. So it was in that faith that we even had the prophecy that God would offer up his own son to be the lamb, uh, the substitution, the atonement, the sacrifice. And as time moves forward in the history of the Hebrews, the nation of Israel, the Jews, we can see how God supernaturally worked uh, in Ruth, who wasn't Jewish, but she became the, a grandmother of, the, of King David. And King David being uh, the monarch and the king and the type and the image of the Messiah and we just see God supernaturally working there and acting there to preserve and to proclaim to David that there would be a king from his uh, from his family who would sit on the r throne and he would reign and rule forever. We can see that God preserved this bloodline of David until it was united in Joseph and Mary, who were both descendants of David. Uh, and it, this was preserved so that at the right moment in human history, the Messiah came to the Jews. Therefore, the birth of Jesus as the Messiah is a sign and wonder that is a demonstration of God's power and delivering the nation of Israel from its bondage, even though they were looking for a physical, political king to come in and to rule and reign in that way. The Messiah came, and not only did God use the prophet Isaiah to foretell or prophesy that the Messiah would be born to a virgin, God used the prophet Isaiah to foretell and prophesy uh, that he would be a suffering servant, that he would be wounded, that he would be bruised, and that he would be pierced just as it happened to Jesus. And the to me and to many people, the greatest sign and wonder given that proves the authenticity of Jesus is, uh, and those who witnessed his life is the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. As you go back and you read the life of Jesus in the Gospels, in the New Testament, you can find as the week of Jesus' passion grew closer and his ministry became more and more public, the Jews were clamoring and demanding that Jesus offer to them a sign as a proof that he was indeed the promised Messiah. And Jesus would repeatedly tell them, I'm not giving you this great heavenly sign that you're looking for, and they continued to press him. And at one point in time, finally, he told him, you're demanding this great heavenly sign, even as I'm working these miracles, but the only sign that you will receive from God to prove my ministry is the sign of Jonah. If you, were, if you will remember or go back and look, Jonah was the Old Testament prophet who was swallowed by the great fish or the whale. And for three days, he was in the belly of this great fish. He was in the belly of this whale, essentially dead. And at the end of that time, the Lord moved so that the fish spit Jonah up uh, where Jonah needed to go. 
And Jonah went into Nineveh, and he preached re- uh, that they should repent for their sins. And so Jonah was this type in this prophecy of Jesus, and Jesus fulfilled this prophecy and did so in a way that proved beyond a shadow of a doubt to all who witnessed the resurrection of Jesus that God had indeed accepted the sacrifice of Jesus and so provided so great a salvation and a Savior to a world in desperate need. We see also that God was bearing witness with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit. When Jesus came and taught the Jewish people, he came performing the signs, wonders, and various miracles that set the people free from sin, sickness, and demonic powers. John the Baptist, who announced Jesus as the Messiah, still doubted when he was on death row because he, like the Jews, expected a political deliverer. Jesus responded to John the Baptist's doubts by pointing out to John that the miracles being performed proved Jesus to be the promised Messiah. Thus God proves through Jesus to John the Baptist and to us that this is a better covenant than the old covenant and that God's kingdom is greater than any kingdom in this world. And other people have claimed to do miracles, and there will be a day and a time when false prophets come and do miracles. But you have to look at the spectacular ministry of Jesus during that time, that the uh, roughly three years, three and a half years of his public ministry, where he was so very active and the power of God's Spirit was moving with Jesus to do these signs and wonders, these wonders and miracles. The blind were receiving their sight. The lame were walking. Uh, the Those who actually had physical impediments and could not speak, the dumb were uh, made able to speak. And the signs and the miracles and the wonders that Jesus performed, there was no way a charlatan could perform those signs. And even if somebody could perform one of those signs, nowhere near the magnitude and the multitude of the signs and the miracles and the wonders that Jesus performed over the time of his public ministry. And In the days, the months, the years, and the centuries following the resurrection of Jesus, God's witness of Jesus as the promised Savior is still found in the body of Christ, the church. Throughout the church's history, beginning at Pentecost, God demonstrates powerfully His will and pleasure in establishing this new covenant with a chosen people from all tribes and races. This demonstration of God's witness is through the power of the Holy Spirit at work in the believers of Jesus who make up the church and the kingdom of God in this world. It's true that the workings of the Holy Spirit were especially powerful in the first century church as the gifts of the Spirit were active in proving the validity of the message being preached. Today, the written Word of God proves the truth of the message, and the gifts of the Holy Spirit continue to edify and build up the body of Christ to carry the message forward as light into a world of darkness. And it is amazing and astounding, even this day and this time. The early church, they didn't have the New Testament the way that we have it today. But they did have the eyewitnesses and the apostles and those who had lived with and who had ate with and who knew Jesus so personally. And these men and even women were going out across the known the world that was known to them at the time, preaching powerfully and with boldness. And we're talking about a group of men who days before were hiding, and then when the day of Pentecost had come, the Spirit filled them with such power 
that they couldn't be stopped from preaching. Can I tell you the Spirit of God is still at work in the church today? We don't always see God's Spirit working the way that we want His Spirit to work, and that's kind of the point because it, the Holy Spirit is God. And the Holy Spirit will work as He desires and as He wills and as He knows what is necessary to prove to those who are hearing the gospel message that it is a true message and a sound message. It is the message to give your full attention to. It is a message of so great a salvation that you should never neglect it. And we see also in this that God was bearing witness according to his own will. And it is the will of God to reveal to the whole world this new covenant of his grace and mercy versus the covenant of law. Just recently I read a well-intentioned article that made was trying to make the point that the law has passed away. Jesus said... Not one small part of my law, Old Testament or New Testament, Old Covenant, New Covenant, will pass away until the heavens and the earth pass away. And that's the other part of the book of Hebrews that we've been talking about the New Testament. We're talking about Jesus Christ and how essential it is. But all of this, even the Old Mosaic Covenant, that has been now superseded by the new covenant of grace, it is still necessary for the old covenant of law. You shall not kill. You shall not steal. Uh, I actually think you shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. And I go back to King James Version to remember even some of the Ten Commandments, and we can look at those and real. that's the law. You shall not. We go back to that and we see that. And we understand that the will of God is not that we should live like the world, but that we should strive to reach for His holiness. And then we realize we can't make it. We're going to fall short. I can't be perfect like God is perfect. But Jesus, according to God's will, did live that perfect human life, and He sacrificed His perfect human life for me who fails and who is imperfect. And this is that great salvation that because He sacrificed His life, because He carried my sin and your sin to the grave, and because God raised Him from the grave uh, in three on that third day that God says, Yes, I have accepted payment for your sins. There is atonement. There is redemption. There is forgiveness. There is grace and there is mercy and there is hope. You may still be on a ship sailing through the troubled waters of this life, but if you will step aside and let Jesus take the helm, if you will let me fill you with my spirit, my will is to get you through through and into the kingdom of God. And this is this great salvation that we should not neglect, that we've got to give our full attention to, that we have got to hold on to, and God will carry us through because it is our faith in Jesus that is the superior way to have this relationship with God. And in there is nothing better in this life than to have a relationship with God that will last us and pay off and give us absolutely eternal benefits that are beyond measure. You have been listening to Verse by Verse, the radio ministry of Calvary Chapel, McDonough. We hope that you have gotten to know God a little better today, and by getting to know God better, hopefully you will be better equipped to make up your own mind about Him. For more information, please visit our website at www.calvarymcd.org. That's www.calvarymcd.org. We would also like to invite you to come and visit us in person on Sunday mornings at 1030. We're located in Stockbridge, Georgia at 1041 Millers Mill Road. 
Thanks for listening, and join us again next week as we journey verse by verse through the Bible.